right. Well, hey, uh, once again, good evening, everybody. Uh, last week, uh, well, as you know, for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking along the lines of, uh, what do we say, that this is the year of application, right? And so uh, over the couple of weeks, we've been talking about what does it mean to operate within the space of the kingdom? Okay, so we talked about, you know, the faith uh, being, you know, uh, the currency of heaven, love being the language, you know, we talked about the, the Holy Spirit being the identification of heaven. Then we transitioned and started to talk about what does it mean to be glory carriers, glory carriers. Once again, Romans 8 speaks of the earth waiting in expectation for the appearance of the sons of God. So why is our appearance so critical? Why is it necessary for us to be on the scene? And that is because we have what the world needs. And oftentimes the reason why the world is, is frustrated is because we are not being who God has called us to be. And so we've been having this conversation along the lines of what it means to be a glory carrier. And more specifically, we've been talking about choices. So over the last couple of weeks, we've been spelling out the choices that God puts before us. And so last week we talked along the lines of you have been here too long and, uh, and tonight we're going to do a part two on that. Uh, folks, it was important to uh, to talk about it, to go a little deeper in it. Actually, I had a couple of people uh, to reach out to me concerning this particular message. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time with it tonight. And I trust that by the time we're finished with it, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be ready to move on to something else uh, should the Lord stay the same. And so last week, uh, if you weren't able to uh, to catch the message, uh, we were coming from Deuteronomy chapter one, verses one through eight. And uh, in a quick recap, what we see in this story is this is Moses essentially recapping the last 40 years of the children of Israel's experience in the wilderness. He talked about how God had spoke to them, how he had led them out of, cap, uh, uh, out of Egypt uh, into the wilderness. And, and how in that season that God spoke to them saying, you know, send out spies, I'm getting ready to send you into a promised land, right? And so what we know from that story and what we know from reading the Bible is, is that the children of Israel, that first generation, they missed out on the promise. They missed out on the promise because they did not believe what God was saying concerning what he wanted for them. Ultimately, they re uh, we, they re believe the report of the 12, uh, I believe the, the Bible calls, excuse me, the 10 bad spies, the 10 wicked spies, meaning that they saw something good. Uh, they understood it to be good because God said it was good, but then they, they counteracted what they saw by giving their own confession, their own negative confession as related to what God wanted for them. And so they believed the negative confession. And as a result, a whole generation missed out on the promise of God. Now, what we talked about last week, you know, oftentimes when we when we see the wilderness in the Bible, we, we relate it to being something negative. The wilderness is not always negative. I could say that the wilderness is not negative because God led them to the wilderness. And so anything that God is leading you to is not bad, okay? And so, but we, we also talked about uh, the fact that uh, God was manifest in the form of a cloud uh, in this interaction with the children of Israel. Anytime that he stayed in one location, uh, they were supposed to stop there and they were supposed to camp there. But anytime that the cloud lifted and left, the children of Israel were supposed to get up and follow the cloud, meaning that the place that they were in, even though it was good the day before, it's no longer good if they chose to stay there instead of following the cloud. And so long story short, the wilderness served a purpose. And that's, that's the main thing that uh, I hope that uh, we were all able to take from last week. The wilderness served a purpose. Uh, there is an appointed season or a, a time for us to experience our own wilderness of sorts, okay? Uh, and so we might not be out in the desert, you know, we might not be out and, you know, walking around, uh, you know, uh, in a circle for 40 years. But the reality is, is that there are seasons when things feel exceptionally difficult. 
where we're frustrated in our efforts, uh, you know, and it's just challenging. You know, it doesn't seem that there's a lot of productivity. In essence, that becomes a type of wilderness experience for us. But here was the thing about the wilderness for the children of Israel, and I hope that we understand that this applies to us as well. The wilderness served as an opportunity for them to do three things. Uh, uh, they actually did a, a few things, but three things I want you to take away from what was supposed to happen in their wilderness experience. One, they were supposed to learn about God and his ability, okay? The second thing was is that they were supposed to learn how they are to relate to God. And what does that mean? How do I relate to God? What is, if, if I understand God and his ability, I'm seeing all of these signs, I'm seeing all of these demonstrations, how is it that I relate to this God and, and all of this greatness that he's able to do, especially when I'm aware of who I am? And then the third thing I want you to get is, is that who they were in God. And so that's something totally different from how I relate to God. I relate to God because he's chosen me out uh, from, from amongst uh, wherever I was at. And, but he's called me to be a representation of him, okay? And so that's how I understand who I am in God. And so these three things took place in their wilderness experience. And, uh, and if you wanted, uh, if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to read Exodus 20. Uh, that's, that's the Ten Commandment chapter, but that's actually where you can see a lot of this unfolding. They were to learn about God and his ability in this two year span before God said, I'm getting ready to send you into the land of Can uh, Canaan, your promised land. They were supposed to learn about God and his ability. Uh, they were supposed to learn how they were to relate to God and they were supposed to understand who they were in God, okay? And so while the wilderness once again served a purpose, it was not a place of permanence, okay? It is a place of transition. The wilderness is not a permanent place, it's a transitional place, okay? A transitory place. They were supposed to graduate from that place. And this is what we gotta, this is what we gotta realize. Yes, God led them into the wilderness, but as we understand, the wilderness had a, a deadline. There was a season in which that wilderness came to an end. Children of Israel, uh, it was supposed to be two years. Jesus Christ went into the wilderness for what, 40 days. Uh, Paul even had his own type of wilderness experience. Uh, I believe the, uh, when he talks about how he was in Damascus for, for three years, there's a, a, an appointed time, but there's a deadline for that wilderness season. And so they were supposed to graduate from that place. And then Here's the thing, they saw everything that God did in that two years. This is how you know that they were coming to an end of a thing. They saw, uh, they saw God deliver them from out of Egypt, out of oppression. They, they saw the plagues and how the plagues didn't impact them, how it didn't touch them. Uh, they saw how God destroyed Pharaoh, Pharaoh's army you know, in the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, they saw how water came from the rock. Uh, they got the Ten Commandments. I mean, God was feeding them with uh, miracle food, with the, with the manna from heaven. They saw all of these things in two years. And so when it was time for God to lead them into Canaan, the question is, how is it now all of a sudden that you can't believe that you can take this land? You've seen all of these things that God has just done for you, but now you begin to question your ability in taking this land. That should have been an invitation for them to start thinking about, you know, what kind of blinds or, you know, carpets or whatever they wanted to put in their house. But the reality was, is that they started to see themselves as insignificant based upon what they perceived to be someone else's opinion, meaning that they never asked the giants. They just assumed that the giants would see them as grasshoppers. And because they assumed that the giants would see them as grasshoppers, they ultimately missed out on what it was that God was saying to them. And so because of their unbelief, they could not enter into uh, the promised land that God had for them. Now, I've shared this, uh, this story a few times. Um, you can read this. This is actually after the children of Israel uh, reject God's uh, commandment or God's invitation to go into the promised land and proceed forward. Something very interesting happens in the Bible. 
the children of Israel, as God has given them uh, this judgment, as he has punished them with this 40 years of wandering in the desert, uh, the children of Israel begin circling the desert. And what happens is, is that they begin to encounter all of these different people groups, okay? And, and, and God begins to talk to them about each group of people that they encounter as they're circling in the wilderness. And God says, you're not to cohabitate with them. And if you do business with them, you must purchase goods. Only, you're, you're only able to buy from them. But it, as God was saying this to them, there's something also interesting that God begins to say to them. God says, these same people were in a similar situation to you, but they are now in a land that I had given them because they believed me. And I want to put that before you because oftentimes what will what, happen is, is when we're failing to, to get out of a place, we'll start to encounter situations, scenarios, and people who were in similar situations, but they stepped out. And now we get to see what it looks like for someone to be operating in their promise. Because I said uh, last week, we talked about this, God did not create a new promised land. It, it took them so they got into a position to receive the promised land that they were now able to enter in. It was not a new promised land. And so literally they were circling the promised land, getting different vantage points, meaning they were seeing different people operating within the scope of their promise, being reminded that they too have a promise that they were not living in. And so it wasn't until once again, they came into position spiritually, mentally, that they were now able to enter into what it was that God had for them. And let me not forget that it was also that when that older generation, those who didn't believe, when they passed away, now the new generation who had the courage to believe, now they were able to enter in, okay? And so uh, I, I'll, I'll use this as an example. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to lose some weight, right? And so, you know, there'll be, uh, you know, people who, who are, you know, they've lost the weight, you know, and they talk about their program and, and whatever they, they were doing. Long story short, their story is telling me of the end result. It doesn't necessarily matter what program or routine they used. It's their, their narrative might be similar. It might have been a health scare that led them onto this road of, of getting things in order. And long story short, now I see the end result. Uh, if that's not your scenario, that's not your wilderness experience, it might be money, it might be whatever. But the thing is, is that we have to start asking ourselves, has God been speaking the instruction and I've, I've been failing to, 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 course, to give the corresponding answer of yes to your will and to your way? Now, uh, before I get off to, to too much of a tangent, I am going to read some scriptures tonight because uh, uh, I think that's appropriate. So. Uh, we're going to start at Joshua uh, 24. I'm going to read Joshua 24, 15, and then I'm going to read Acts 17 and 30. Uh, and I think I'm going to read Acts 17 and 30 from the Amplified. So once again, tonight we're talking about you've been here too long. This is part two of the message last week. All right, so Joshua 24, uh, verse 15, it reads, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, jumping over to Acts really quickly. Acts chapter 17. Uh, this is verse uh 30, and it reads, uh, this is the Amplified Version, such former ages of ignorance, God, it is true, ignored and allowed to pass unnoticed. But now he charges all people everywhere to repent, to change their minds for the better, and heartily to amend their ways with abhorrence of their past sins. I'm going to read a little bit into 31 because he has fixed a day when he will judge the world righteously, justly by a man whom he has destined and appointed for that task. 
All right. And so I want to start by saying this. You have been equipped uh, with the tools to win in those areas uh, of, that have caused you to enter into a wilderness. Let me, let me put it that way. Uh, now, when the tests come, the test is to come to, to try the validity of your faith in what God says is yours. Okay, so, so ignorance, because we just read this in Acts 17, ignorance may have led you to the wilderness, but it, uh, ignorance won't allow you to leave the wilderness, okay? Now, ignorance is when we don't know. That's just, you know, I don't know. But here's the thing. A lot of us are choosing to be ignorant, and we're, we're, we're thinking that that is a valid excuse. The problem that, that we're going to find ourselves encountering is, is that God will remind us that he's given us the information to win in the area that we're suffering losses in. And so now we, we're, not, we're not operating in, igno uh, in ignorance, we're actually operating in willful disobedience. We'll find ourselves once again rotating in this circle asking God why, but God is still pointing back to the information that he gave you to win in that area. Now, what I said earlier is, is that ignorance may lead you into a wilderness. We don't know what we don't know. The children of Israel were not in position to, to rule and to dominate. That's why that two-year period was critical for them. God instituted laws. He gave them commandments. He gave them order. He gave them structure. He gave them a place of worship. He gave them the, uh, the, the, the tenets and, and the protocol of how to interact with him. All of these things they did not know when they were in Egypt. But now that they know these things and they're still choosing not to do those things, it becomes a problem because you can't enter into the promise because you have not narrowed down these things that I've given you to do. And best believe I'm preaching to myself as I'm, I'm sharing these things. And so once again, we don't have the benefit of claiming ignorance in the season of our transition. The reason why is because the test that we will experience is coming to try the information that you already have. The test doesn't come unless the information is there. And so when the word, uh, I believe this is James, it says count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The temptations are evidence that you are equipped to win in that area. Even, even the word says that God won't put more on you than you are able to bear, okay? And so uh, that there's no temptation that's, uh, you know, uh, uncommon to man, you know? So long story short, if it comes to you, the confidence is that God has prepared me for this moment. But the issue is, is that we're forgetting what God has equipped us with. And as a result, we find ourselves staying too long in a wilderness. Now, once again, when God led us to, to the wilderness, it's okay because he's with us. Hey, you know, uh, he's showing us his strength. He's showing us his ability. But now it comes to the point where your being there is actually a hindrance to what it is that God is trying to accomplish through you. And then we have to ask ourselves, have I been in this place too long? Because a lot of the stuff that we find ourselves wrestling with year after year, we have long outlived that post dated season when that thing was supposed to come to an end. And I hope that this makes sense to everybody on here. And so once again, for this reason, we cannot claim ignorance, especially if we know that we've been given the, the instruction. We have to accept that we are operating in willful disobedience. In this instance, we're deciding to go in a different direction and asking God to endorse it. And that's something that God will not do. God is not going to endorse something that we of our own whim say, hey, God, I know what you said, do, but I'm going to do this. And I'm gonna ask that you bless it anyway. Even uh, there's a story about King Saul, how how he disobeyed God. He still wanted Samuel to come by and endorse him in front of the people, and so and, and Samuel couldn't do it. And the reality is, is that there's things that God is telling us not to do, but we say, okay, God, I think I got it on this one. I'm going to do it anyway. And then, oh, God, forgive me. I should have never did that. That's asking God to endorse something that, that we did on our own whim rather than getting his instruction and his guidance. Now, I'll tell you this, that for myself, there are, are some things that 
uh, right now that I am confronting. You know, I've seen the different vantage points, right? Uh, I've, I've encountered people who who are were in similar situations. You know, I'm not going to spell it all out here tonight, but I've encountered people who were in similar situations, and I see what it looks like when they step forward and how God has blessed them in those areas. And for me, I have to acknowledge that God, my, my, my struggle and my challenge is keeping me from entering into the next level. I was having, this, excuse me, I was having this conversation with my wife, uh, I think on yesterday, and I was telling her that uh, I know that I have reached a ceiling and the way to press in is to put into operation the, the instruction that God has already given me. And that's how you get out of staying in this rut of staying in a place too long. And like I said, I don't know what your wilderness is. We all have a wilderness of sorts. Uh, it's a part of life. The wilderness is not, like I said, it's not always a bad thing. It, it, it is meant to, to, to not only test you, but it's meant to develop you. But there comes a point in time when we are beyond that stage of development but we are refusing to fit, to pass the test. And so uh, as, as we're, we're bringing this year to an end, uh, like I said, I was sharing uh, previously, I, I try to use every year around this time as a time of reflection. And, and in this time of reflection, I understand that I'm in a place right now where I have to make a decision and the decision is made. And so the reality is, is that I cannot find myself in this perpetual cycle of, of year after year experiencing the same frustration on account of me being disobedient. And maturity, it requires us to acknowledge where we are willfully missing God. I know that most people won't, won't share that with you. Most people don't even believe that, that we can willfully miss God as believers. But the reality, it, it, it is so. There are certain areas in our lives that we have not died to. We have not yielded total control to the Lord in those areas. And that's possible as a believer. To be a believer, yes, I, I, I love God, but yes, there are areas in me that I struggle with yielding to God. And same with the children of Israel. They saw all these great feats. They experienced all of these great things with God, but yet there was an area within them and it related to their significance, it related to their self-worth, their self-value, and ultimately their insecurities and their inadequacies became bigger than the God that they had been following. And so my, my prayer is that none of us find ourselves in a place where we are still so insecure in our own belief as, as it relates to how we understand ourselves that we can't act when God is saying act. I've shared it and I'm getting ready to close right here uh, on a number of occasions. Poverty is not your portion. Illness is not your portion. We're supposed to be healthy. Um, Psalms talks about the benefits that belongs to the believers. And if we are not living a life uh, where, where these benefits are a part of our life, then we have to ask ourselves, God, do I believe you in that area? God, am I still stuck in a wilderness knowing that you have left you've given me the instruction you've called me to move forward but i'm choosing to stay here we have to start has, having these these necessary conversations not with everybody else but with ourselves and with god because as we do that what god will begin to do is he'll begin to highlight the strongholds in your area and then he'll once again he'll revert you back to the instruction that you need to win in that area and so uh, I'm going to close right there. Uh, I hope that, uh, you know, we were able to, to, to cover whatever wasn't covered last week. Uh, and if there's any questions. Uh, <laughs>